Well, I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you would, today to the book of Romans, chapter, 20, or chapter 8, verse 29. And this morning we're going to wrap up, as Jonah said, our series on a G-O-D perspective on my J-O-B. And we're going to consider a message I've entitled, The Workplace, Our Growing Place. And this morning I want you to see your workplace, where you go to work, as a place for spiritual growth. I want you to see it as a place for spiritual maturity, that God wants to grow us in our job. Because during our lifetime, 40% of our time, we will spend working, and if we don't learn how to integrate work into our spiritual life, 40% of our lives in the area of personal development and growth is wasted. Therefore, God wants us to integrate our work into our life. Now, <clears throat> what, is the, what is the goal? What is God's goal for our development? Talking about growing place, spiritual development. Well, notice in our, in our Bible, Romans 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I'd like you to notice that verse in the Living Bible Translation. It says, from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him should what? Become like his son. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this, another amazing opportunity to share a message from your word with your people today. I pray that you would take these words that I will speak with my audible voice, and they will hear with their physical ear. I pray you would take them, Lord, and your still small voice would echo them to our soul. Father, use this time to mold us and to shape us into becoming the children of God that you called us to be. And we pray it, Lord, all of this, asking it in Jesus' name, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'd like you to notice what the Bible says in Ephesians. It says, real maturity is that measure of development which is meant by the fullness of Christ. So the gist, if you will, of those two verses we've just looked at is that God's goal for my life is that I will develop the character of Jesus Christ. Now how does my job fit into that? How does my job make me like Christ? How can I become Christ-like through my career? How can I become like Jesus on my job? And well, there are many, many ways. And there are, there are many aspects to our job that God can use to build Christ-like character in our lives. But this morning, I just want us to look at three aspects of the things God uses at work to help me grow spiritually. Here's the first thing he uses. God uses pressure at work to teach me responsibility. And I think this first one is very, very important because we don't really hear many people talking about personal responsibility today. Today it's no-fault divorce. Today it's government assistance that's just completely through the roof cashless bail for crimes that are committed. In our society today, there is a very great decline of personal responsibility. Everybody talks about my rights, but nobody talks about personal responsibility. Some in this nation believe health care is a right. Maybe it is. I'm not here to argue that point today, but many believe health care is a right. Others think it's a violation of my rights if I'm asked to prove I'm a citizen before I vote. Some think marijuana and other drugs should be legal. It's my body, they say. I have a right to protest and to demonstrate. Fine. But can you do it respectfully, not as an agitator? Can you do it responsibly, not taunting the law enforcement? Can you do it without violence and the destruction of private and civic property and looting of businesses? I mean, fine, you want to demonstrate? You want to protest? Follow the example of Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., 
Susan B. Anthony. Everybody today talks about my rights, but nobody wants to talk about my responsibilities. Let's blame everybody else. Pass the buck. It's not my fault. It's all your fault. The court systems are clogged with because nobody wants to accept personal responsibility for anything. After the Gulf oil rig disaster, Transocean said, well, Halliburton is the one responsible for this oil disaster. They're the ones who did the poor job pouring the concrete at the, at the base of the rig. It's their fault. Halliburton said, oh, no, no, uh, BP is the party responsible. They operate the rig. BP said, oh, no, 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 you got to go back to the top. It's Transocean. They own the rig. Finally, a real leader stepped forward, and President Obama said, well, it's not my administration's fault. It was Bush's fault. He dismantled all the safety regulations. It's his fault. Most psychiatrists will tell us, accepting personal responsibility for our own actions and behavior is actually the key to mental health. And, well, I want to add that it's the key to spiritual health as well, spiritual growth. In fact, personal responsibility is not only the key to mental health and spiritual growth, it's the key, I think, to career success. We grow by being responsible. It stretches us. Every job has unique pressures. Did you know that stress can be beneficial to our spiritual growth? It can. And thank God there is something, you know, some value to it. For instance, have you ever had a, had a task that you had to complete, but you didn't feel like completing it, but you did it anyway? Sure. Well, through that, we develop responsibility. And responsibility is when we do the right thing, whether we feel like it or not. I want you to notice this passage in Ephesians. Live life, then, with due sense of responsibility, not as people who do not know the meaning of life, but it's those who do. He's saying that work is a school for responsibility. It's where we learn to be responsible. Anytime our boss gives us a responsibility, anytime a parent gives responsibility to a child, we grow through it. Howard Hendricks, a man I talked about last week who was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, once said, if I had to do it over, I would do less for my kids and make them do more for themselves. I can relate to that. Because when we take responsibility for a person, we are taking responsibility from that person. And God wants us to learn personal responsibility. It's one of the characteristics of Christ, and we learn it through our work. You say, well, how do we learn it through our work? Well, there are many, many ways. I'm going to just give you four ways that we can develop personal responsibility through our work. Here's A. We do it by keeping promises. Psalm 15.4 says this, God blesses the one who what? Keeps their promises no matter what the cost. It seems today very few people can be counted on to keep their word. And, and leaders, let's be honest, they set the tone. We no longer live in a nation where our politicians would be named Honest Abe. Today's politicians make promises on the campaign trail only to be elected and to tell people, well, that was just campaign rhetoric. God blesses people who keep their word. You get a professional athlete out there and he signs a multi-million dollar contract, but then a couple of years in, he, he, he gets disgruntled and he wants to renegotiate his contract. That's irresponsible. You sign the contract, you live up to it. Did you know that airlines will deliberately overbook? It's true. We were out to dinner on Friday night and I was talking to, I just met a uh, my daughter's future mother-in-law and her husband, and we were, we were talking, and she was talking, telling us about the time she took her younger son on a vacation, and when they got ready to come home, they were told they overbooked. 
and they had to put them on another flight. Now, they compensated them some money as well, but the point is, the flight was full. And, they, and, and airlines do that because they are expecting up to, not necessarily always, but up to 30% no-show and cancellation. And they want their flights full. And so the next time you find out that you've been bumped from a flight due to overbooking, it wasn't an accident. Or what about the contractor who maybe underbids a job? And halfway through it, he realizes it. And so he leaves that job unfinished. Folks, it happens. In fact, they made, they made a uh, reality show about it. Or what about the person who partied all night the night before, and so they're tired or they're hungover, and they don't come into work the next day? God says, if you say you're going to show up, if you're hired to show up, God says, you show up. And so one of the marks of spiritual maturity is that we keep our promises. We learn to develop responsibility, and we keep our word. Here's another way. B, by meeting deadlines. That's another way we develop personal responsibility at work, by meeting deadlines. Proverbs 18 says this, One who is slack in his work is a brother to the one who destroys. What he's saying here is, if I'm lazy, I'm sabotaging the work of my boss. I'm sabotaging his business. That when I waste time that I'm being paid for, I'm being destructive. And so by meeting deadlines, by getting things done on time, that develops personal responsibility. Here's a third area, C. We develop personal responsibility by working without supervision. Notice Ephesians 6. It says this, Don't work hard only when your master is watching. Work hard all the time as though you're working for Christ. We've talked about this many times in this series. I knew about a guy in another community who was and perhaps still is, I don't know, but he was a church deacon. And well, he worked for a company... And a friend of his worked for that company, too. And that friend had recently been promoted to uh, being a purchasing agent for the company, among other functions he had. And anyway, that guy who uh, I refer to as a church deacon, that's what he was, he asked the other man to buy him something through the company. Not to use at work, but to keep, to have as his own. The other guy, who was someone of greater and genuine integrity, unlike the church deacon I'm talking about, he told the man, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, the the so-called deacon said, nobody will ever know. The boss isn't going to find out. You know how big this company is. You're buying stuff all the time. Nobody's going to know. Everybody does it. Now, this guy, this church deacon, mind you, He also claimed workman's comp for an injury that occurred at home. You say, well, how do I know that? His own daughter told me this. And she said it to me, you know, and here I am a pastor. But she said it to me not thinking that it was wrong. She said because her family couldn't afford it if he had to be off work otherwise. You see how that father's sin corrupted his daughter? She's making excuses. She thinks it's okay. That's so sad. Well, the guy with integrity, when that man said, nobody will know, the boss won't find out, you know what he knew? He knew that his real boss was never out. He sees everything always. God says the mark of responsibility is when you serve in spite of whether you're being supervised or micromanaged or not. We work responsibly. That's just part of the integrity we have about us. How do you work when you're not supervised? Do you pilfer and pillage? Do you slack off or do you take initiative? As God is my witness, one time I was training somebody new at work. And I told him, you know, if you, if you see something that needs done, just take the initiative and do it. 
a fellow co-worker was passing by at the time, and he heard it, and he said, take initiative, yeah, right. Well, in spite of having seniority, guess what? He wasn't the one training the new staff. I was. Today, God has put me in charge of kingdom work. Now, that scoffer that I'm talking about graduated from a waiter to what is what we were at the time to a clerk in a retail hardware store. And I don't mean to insinuate that there's anything wrong with retail employment. I've done it before. Uh, I perhaps will do it again someday. Okay? But my point, however, is this. Notice what the Bible says in Luke. The man who is faithful in little things will be faithful in big things too. But if you cheat even a little, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. God says if you cheat with office supplies, you'll cheat on anything. He's saying we need to be responsible in every area. The Bible has two words for responsibility. It's the word faithfulness and the word stewardship. They both mean responsibility. I've had people come up to me over the years and say, well, pastor, when I get more money, I'll, that's when I'm going to start tithing then. And I just nod and I usually leave it at that. I teach and preach tithing. But that's not something God has called me to enforce. I'm not God's enforcer. I'm not a perfect person, and therefore I don't possess the moral efficacy to authoritatively impose compliance of God's Word on anyone. And besides, God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't want you giving grudgingly, reluctantly. But the principles of tithing, I, I will preach them and I will teach them because they come from the one who is perfect and who is sovereign. And what God says to the person who says, when I get more money, then I'll tithe, He says this, no, you won't. If you don't tithe when you make a little, you certainly aren't going to tithe when you make a lot. If you can't give $40 on the 400 you brought home, you're not going to give 1000 on the 10000 you bring home. If we're not faithful in little, we're not going to be faithful in much. Responsibility is working without supervision, being faithful even when we know no one is around to enforce it. Here's the fourth area where I can develop responsibility at work. D, by controlling costs. Notice what the Bible says here. If you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's money, why should you be entrusted with money of your own. That's interesting. Did you know that the Bible says that the greatest way that God tests our responsibility, that He tests our faithfulness, is through money? In fact, it says here that if we're not responsible with worldly wealth, God will not trust us with the true riches of heaven. What does that mean? It means God looks at my finances, my giving, my spending, to determine whether He can bless my life and to what degree He can bless it. Why is that? Why does God use money as the acid test of my responsibility? Because we spend most of our lives trying to get it, trying to make it, trying to spend it, and trying to save it. And so God looks at how I spend it, how I save it, whether I tithe, what percentage I give, all these factors. And He says, if I'm not faithful in handling my money, He won't trust me with true spiritual blessings. And that's pretty strong. Most of you probably probably know this, or maybe some of you don't, but, you know, every Friday, I run to multiple stores buying whatever the church needs for meals, for the breakfast bar out there, office supplies, janitorial needs, whatever. Whatever we need on a weekly basis, every Friday, I'm out doing that first thing. Now, could I just get everything at one store? Not everything, but for the most part, yeah, most things, most weeks, I could go into one store and I could get it all and leave that store. So why do you go to multiple stores? I go so that I get the best price that doesn't compromise quality. You say, well, that takes a lot of time, and you're only going to save a few bucks every week by doing that. And you know what? That's true. I only save a few dollars a week. But those savings add up over the course of a year 
And with those savings, I feel like we can justify doing things like the Mother's Day giveaway, the Father's Day giveaway, the Libs candy at Christmas. And it's the same thing I could say about all the remodeling that's gone on here over the years. If I can do it and save money here and there, well then we can get hands-free faucets when we need to replace them in the restrooms. We can have a fireplace in that cafe. We can put in a commercial coffee maker in the breakfast bar and things like that. I set about to prove I'm responsible and faithful and trustworthy to this congregation by controlling costs. Now, maybe, maybe that's not something that's a part of your job. So you glean from this message the things you can, and you take that and apply it to your job. Here's the second way God uses work to help me grow spiritually. Number two, God uses people at work to teach me about relationships. He uses pressures at work to teach me responsibility, but he uses people to teach me relationships. And one of the most important skills that we can learn at work is how to get along with other people. That ability is sink or swim. Because the biggest problem in any office, in any factory, on any job site, in any ministry workplace, is personality problems. I mean, even between uh, me and Jonah, and we haven't had any problems yet. But when and if they do come, it's not going to be over doctrine. We're both in agreement on General Baptist theology. We're not rivals. We're not competitors. We both want to try new things to better connect with this generation that we're serving in. But here's the thing. I am a baby boomer. I have life experiences that have shaped my personality. And he's, he's Gen Z with a completely different set of, well, actually fewer life experiences that shape his personality. Listen, we may look at God the same way, but I'll bet you Jonah and I, we don't look at life or society, the culture, probably even the temporal future the same. So God uses people at work to teach me about relationships. Rockefeller, one of the titans of industry, said, I pay more for somebody who knows how to get along with others than any other skill. Wow. And work, the Bible teaches us, is a school for relationships. Would you agree that at work you have to deal with all kinds of wonderful and strange and weird people? Yeah. We've all got Brian's and Jonah's we have to work with, right? But reflecting on my work history, I've made a list of what I believe are some very common types of cranky co-workers, and let's see if you recognize any of these from where you work. We'll do a little survey, I'll call them out, and you know, if you can identify with them, just raise your hand, okay? And not for nothing, but if you're sitting by one of these people right now, or maybe you're married to them, don't look at them when I call this out, that wouldn't be good. Here's one. The first person I, I'll, I'll call... Uh, the bulldozer. Anybody ever work with somebody who's pushy and always demanding their own way and tries threats and intimidation? They'll just bulldoze right over you if you... Yeah, yeah, Mark said, yeah. Okay. How about this one? How about a loud speaker? This person doesn't know when to be quiet. They don't, they don't have an inside voice. They just have one volume and their mouth is seemingly always running, always in gear. They talk all the time. It doesn't matter what the topic is. And I'll tell you what, if you get a loudspeaker on the telephone, boy, that can really be annoying. Did anybody work with a loudspeaker? Oh, okay, yeah, I'll be honest. You know, loudspeakers are really hard for me. It's kind of like, you know, nails on a chalkboard. That's how I feel inside. I, ugh, very difficult. How about this? Anybody ever work with a, uh, a killjoy? This person has a knack for spoiling everybody's fun. They see negative in everything. Their favorite phrase is, it won't work, it can't be done, it costs too much, it's impossible. Anybody ever work with a killjoy? Yeah. I'll tell you what, leaders like that in kingdom work can really derail a ministry. How about number four? Anybody ever work with a volcano? Those folks have a temper and it erupts like Mount St. Helens. You never know when they're going to blow up. You're always on eggshells. They make for a very toxic work environment. Anybody ever work with somebody like that? Yeah? Okay. 
How about, you ever work with number five, the whiner? These people are always getting their feelings hurt. And they love to manipulate us by guilt and pity. They love to get attention by whining. Anybody ever work with a whiner? Yeah, okay. Brent, yeah, all right. Uh, those, those are the people you just want to look at and go, oh my God, would you just shut up, right? But you don't do it because you're letting God teach you about relationships, so you don't. <laughs> about the nitpicker? The nitpicker is somebody who finds wrong in everything. They're unpleasable. They're a perfectionist. They're hypercritical. It's hard to work with a nitpicker. And then here's lastly. I'll call him the airhead. You can talk to him, but it doesn't do any good. Lights are on, nobody's home, and everything always takes forever, it seems like, to get through to him. You ever work with anybody like that? Anybody? Yeah. How are we supposed to deal with people like that? What am I supposed to do? What is it that God wants me to do? And well, the Bible is full of advice on how to relate to others. Here's just one passage we'll look at. He says, work happily together. Don't try to act big. Don't try to get into good graces of important people, but enjoy the company of ordinary folks. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil for evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honest, clear through. Don't quarrel with anyone. Be at peace with everyone just as much as is possible. There are five practical suggestions in that passage of Scripture on dealing with people at work. He said, first, he said, work happily together. In other words, he's talking about in cooperation. That's a quality that God wants to teach us through our work, and it usually develops by dealing with difficult people, quite honestly. He says, next, he says, don't try to get into the good graces of important people, but enjoy the company of ordinary folks. God wants us to learn fairness in our lives, and the only way we can do that is to be you know, put around other people because you can't learn to be fair by yourself. He wants to teach us fairness. Next, he said, don't think you know it all. I think God wants to teach us flexibility with that. For although there are many good characteristics I have found that, that Christian farmers hold, this is not from my experience of pastoring a rural church where practically everybody worked in agriculture, flexibility is not one of them. Most farmers are, you know, they have their own small farming operation and they're used to doing things their own way and they're used to calling all the shots and they're used to being very independent-minded and usually they're not very flexible. But again, they do usually have a lot of other good and great qualities. God wants to teach us flexibility at work. Then he said, never pay back evil for evil. You know what that really is often talking about? Humility. Humility is the ability to absorb a hurt and not retaliate. Because if you do, it will only make the place of employment more toxic. And probably it will ultimately come back to bite you in the end. I think the workplace is a good place to learn humility. To learn that Nobody gets through life free of anyone disagreeing with them or not liking them. and have, We just have to accept that. You know, it's reality. In fact, I think it's quite arrogant to, for a person to think that they're going to go all through their life and nobody's going to take issue with them or have a, a disagreement with them or anything like that or, you know, that they would never be offended. I learned this lesson the hard way. I'll be honest with you. I was, I was young. I was in my late 20s. I was very headstrong. I was the associate pastor at a church, but I also worked a full-time job in the supermarket, uh, in the bakery of a supermarket. And I got to tell you, the, the store manager, he, he really was a jerk. Um, you know, when you work in the supermarket industry, it's by and large unskilled labor. I mean, anybody can get hired off the street and they teach you what you need to do. And, you know, because of that, you could say, well, you're a dime a dozen, and that's how he treated all the employees there. And it may be true, but you don't have to treat people that way. Well, one day I'd had, I'd had enough. I just had enough of it. I was sitting in the break room. His office was off to the side. I went up to his door. 
said, yes, spun around in his chair, and I said, uh, called him by name. We'll say Tom, that wasn't his name. I said, Tom. I said, you know, we often don't say the things to one another that we ought to say. I said, he goes, true, true, true. And I said, so I just want to tell you, I think you're probably the best boss I ever worked for. You're fair, you treat everybody the same, you don't show partiality, you don't eat, you know, I just wanted you to know that. Leaned back in his chair and he ex- began to expound to me his managerial philosophy. And I said, well, I just want to let you know. And I started to walk out and he turned around. And then I came back in and I go, oh, one more thing. April Fool's. Now, did that feel good in that moment? Because it was April 1st. Yes, it did. Did it come back to bite me? Yes, it did. Now, I was union. I couldn't be fired, but the workplace became so toxic. I didn't last. I didn't stay more than a year, and I quit. I should have just let that stuff roll off my back and not let it get to me and really focus on what matters. I needed to learn humility. Never pay back evil for evil in the office. That's not what God would have us do. The last thing when that passage there, it says, don't quarrel with anyone. Be at peace with everyone, just as much as possible. That's compromise. God wants to teach us how to compromise. Compromise is not a dirty word. I think 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says it all. Do all your work in love. Lastly, today, here's number three. God uses problems at work to teach me about character. All of us have problems at work. Notice what the Bible says in Romans 5, 3. We can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know they are good for us. They help us learn to be patient, and patience develops strength of character. God is much more interested in perfecting us than he is in pampering us. What does it mean to have strong character? It means to have the character of Christ. What is the character of Christ? It's the fruit of the Spirit. The nine qualities of love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and self-control. How does God produce those things in my life? How does He build strong character in my life? He does it by putting us in the exact opposite situation. That's how He does it. How does God teach us love? By putting us around some very unlovely people. It's easy to love the lovely. It's easy to love somebody, you know, uh, that's close to you, your family, your, your dear friends. It's hard to love that person that's an irritant. The way God does it is He allows some jerks in our lives to teach us genuine love, to teach us to love the unlovely. And I will be honest with you, sometimes I've met that challenge faithfully, as I should, and I've grown, and the fruit of the Spirit has ripened and mature in my life. And sometimes, like what I just talked about, I have failed. So God has just sent another jerk into my life and basically said, one more lap around the wilderness, boy. How does God teach us joy? Joy is not happiness. Happiness depends on happenings, on circumstances. Joy is eternal. You know how God teaches us joy? I think He teaches us joy through disappointment, through failure, through discouragement, through problems, through grief. Teaching us inner joy in spite of our circumstances and our happenings. Oh, it's easy to be at peace when I've got my phone switched off and I'm laying on a beach somewhere. But to teach real peace, he sometimes puts us in a work environment of chaos. He'll put us in a work environment of problems and difficulties and special orders and stresses and pressures and time constraints. In other words, that probably describes working at Chick-fil-A, right? Can't imagine how busy they are in trying to work in that situation. I think it would be teaching us peace through that. How does God teach us patience? He gives us an irritating boss. He puts us in traffic jam going to work. He gives us delays. He has us train someone who has no idea what they're doing. 
How does God teach us kindness? He puts us around somebody who has obvious emotional needs. And that can be a real challenge when we work around somebody who's very needy, when they get their feelings hurt very easily, or they're always needing compliments, and they're always fishing for them, always needing to be reassured. It it can be exhausting and difficult to do if your own job is a very stressful job. But that's where God teaches us kindness. How does he teach us faith? He puts us in situations where we have to take risks, where we're tempted to doubt, where we're tempted to withdraw, where we are full of fear and we have to have faith to make it. How does he teach us goodness? I think he brings an ethical decision to our lives where we have to make the right choice. Just like I told you about the guy who would not, you know, buy his coworker those tools on the company dime. How does he teach us to be gentle? He'll allow us to be criticized. He'll give us opportunities to forgive other people who've hurt us. How does he teach us self-control? He'll put us in a place where we have no supervision. And we have to depend on our own discipline, our own integrity to do the right thing. That's the fruit of the Spirit, and it takes time to ripen in our lives. Those of us who like tomatoes, we've all eaten, you know, gassed tomatoes. Those are the ones you buy in the store. Those are, you know, they take the green tomato and they gas it and it turns it red. But it's not really ripe, right? You can taste the difference, big difference, because fruit develops slowly. And God uses pressure and people at work in our lives for the purpose of making me like Jesus Christ. And so whenever we have a problem at work, we need to ask God, what are you trying to teach me in this situation? And when the problems and the pressures are overwhelming, we need to remember this passage from 2 Corinthians. I think you ought to know about the hard time we went through in Asia, Paul writes. We were really crushed and overwhelmed and feared we would never live through it. We saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. For when we put everything into the hands of God, who alone could save us, and He did help us. We turned the problem over to God through prayer. Just consider this. If I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve it. In conclusion this morning, let's wrap this series up by noticing the payoff when I am faithful to Christ at work and in my job. The Bible says, my Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus said this in Matthew. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Notice those three things I've underlined that Christ spoke of. First, he says, well done. That's affirmation. You know, I can't imagine anything more wonderful than to get to heaven and have God come up to me and say, good job. You did a good job with your life. Well done. You used your work as an act of worship. You used it as a witness. And you allowed me to develop your character through it. Well done. Good job. Second, he says, you, I will put you in charge of many things. You have been faithful with little. You will be faithful with much. We'll get a promotion. And then the third reward, he says, is come. Come and share in your master's happiness. He rewards us with a time of never-ending celebration.